Okay, here we are for another round of talking into my computer for a living. <laughs> I've been doing this all day long, uh, but yet another session. So, uh, the second New Deal. Boys, this is our hour. It's now or never, said Harry Hopkins uh, when he heard or uh, realized that the, the Roosevelt administration uh, was going to uh, press for not only another second wave of legislation and federal programs, but this time a more radical uh, version than the first. And the first, by many people's estimation in the country, was radical enough, or way more than radical. But Harry Hopkins, uh, one of the more left-leaning uh, members uh, of the president's team of top advisors, was certainly on board with this. So why was there a second New Deal, two years after the first, and why uh, was it more uh, 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 radical, uh, meaning uh, th these are more uh, far-reaching programs. These are, are bound to, and they knew it, stir up, uh, they're bound to stir up more controversy with the Republicans, uh, with corporate America, because uh, they were more apt to be class-oriented, to attack uh, uh, disparities of wealth and uh, you know, uh, such uh, in American society. So w why was this even needed? Well, first of all, you probably already figured this out, that after two years, the economy was still mired in depression in 1935. So the public, by this time, remember the stock market crash was in 1929. See, the end. This has been five plus years of depression now. And the public was certainly, uh, you know, uh, quite happy uh, to see Franklin Roosevelt replace Herbert Hoover. And they're still happy with his leadership now, but they still think, because it's more or less true, that their lives have not been put back on course yet, that the economy is still in the doldrums. There are signs that uh, from some economic categories, we saw a few of them in the early graphs at the beginning of the unit, that the, the, the economy was moving in the right direction by some indications, but still far from healthy. So Americans started to become uh, not only more restless, but in many ways this had sapped their confidence by now. If we can say that collectively about a whole people, uh, it, it had. So uh, Americans who were used to having jobs, you know, being fully employed, and if they lost a job, getting one fairly quickly. Some people have now been employed for you know two, three, four, five years, uh, and that starts to wear on somebody's sort of self-esteem uh, and uh, feelings about themselves. Uh, and so uh, there's this kind of pressure mounting, uh, and President Roosevelt felt it. Uh, so did, I think, uh, you know, his uh, more astute advisors like Harry Hopkins and others. Uh, and they decided uh, the public is clearly calling for us to do more, uh, more programs uh, and make them uh, uh, even more stringent uh, than, than before. Uh, and sure enough, they delivered. President Roosevelt, being the politician that he was, the consummate politician that he was, uh, was always good at not only reading the political winds, but then sort of following in that direction. So you can kind of see him saying, okay, the public's, public wants us to do more, and it wants it to be more radical the second time around. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, it's popular. I've got the public behind me, uh, so let's do it. Uh, and Harry Hopkins then with his famous uh, statement above. I'm just going to pick out a few Second New Deal programs, uh, uh, since we got a, a, a whole lot uh, in the First New Deal uh, that we dealt with. But uh, this will give us a flavor of the more radical nature uh, of the Second New Deal. The Works Progress Administration, or WPA, uh, which was created actually by executive order of President Roosevelt uh, after Congress passed the Emergency Relief Appropriation Act of that same year, uh, which is another way to say that the Congress itself realized that the public was dissatisfied uh, and freaking out. And so the Congress passes a law that actually gives the president uh, to some authority uh, to take executive action on his own, which he did. Uh, and the WPA was just one of its results, uh, one of the actions taken, but probably the most important. And sure enough, he puts Harry Hopkins uh, in charge. So Harry Hopkins had previously run the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, or FERA, but this is a bigger job now. Uh, uh, WPA was gigantic uh, and more controversial, so uh, uh, this is sort of the right guy uh, to put in, in place. This guy had the energy, had the drive, uh, had the uh, you know the zeal uh, for these kind of programs, uh, and so off it went. Uh, 
It built, uh, this is also a jobs program, uh, again, relief, uh, recovery, both. Uh, remember, jobs put money in the pocket uh, for relief uh, and sees that same money go out of the pocket uh, for expenditures, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, desire, designed to help the economy recover. Uh, so money uh, in the paycheck goes back out to businesses uh, when you're buying uh, uh, things uh, you need uh, for your household. They built, or the WPA, its uh, administration, its workers, built uh, 20,000 playgrounds, hospitals, airfields, schools, uh, you know, uh, roads, etc. So it was actually kind of like the PWA, not to be confused with the WPA. That's why I said alphabet soup earlier. Uh, but... This is a much bigger program. Uh, Hopkins uh, thought this was uh, important, and there already had been jobs programs. Just mentioned one of the other ones, but he said, "Give a man a dole, which means like a you know a handout, uh, and you save his body, but destroy his spirit. Give a man a job, and you save both body and spirit." Uh, but the, this program was bound to get criticized because it was much more ambitious than uh, any of the other work projects and uh, jobs projects uh, that had been done so far. And Republicans uh, started saying things like, you have one crew uh, uh, sent out digging holes, and then another one afterwards uh, uh, filling them up. <laughs> uh, so basically saying, these are worthless jobs, people doing uh, nothing that's valuable and getting paid for it. Which was, wasn't, of course, true if we just look at the uh, 20,000 playgrounds, hospitals, etc., uh, but uh, there was some argument that could be made in that direction. Uh, again, I said this uh, WPA was vast. Uh, one part of it, this is just one sort of uh, section of the WPA, was called Federal One, uh, and it had four, four components within Federal One. So within the WPA is Federal One. Within Federal One is the Federal Art Project, the Federal Music Project, the Federal Theater Project, and the Federal Writers Project. And yes, you guessed it, it's actually paying musicians and artists and writers and actors and uh, uh, screenwriters uh, to, uh, to do their thing. Uh, and this, of course, was a field day for Republicans. Like, are you kidding? Uh, taxpayer money, federal government dollars are going to pay, you know, what, what they saw anyway as like lazy actors and artists. Uh, who are, what, painting murals, which is partly what they were doing uh, in cities uh, uh, around the country. Uh, but uh, Roosevelt and his New Dealers, I think, were shrewd here yet again, and that is that, first of all, they saw uh, that this would have the benefit of helping to uh, increase or prop up morale, uh, right? Uh, Roosevelt was no, he was came from a, of course, rich kid's background, but he was no sort of highbrow when it came to culture and art and things like that. But he did understand uh, its value. Uh, and uh, so uh, he understood the, the importance of culture uh, uh, sort of being maintained and even you know put uh, pushed forward by the government in a time of uh, sort of you know, depression in both senses of the word. Uh, but also, uh, another way this is, I think, shrewd is that it didn't necessarily matter, uh, uh, I think, to them. You see this in some uh, Keynesian economists around even today. Uh, it doesn't necessarily matter what people are getting paid for uh, if you're thinking in Keynesian counter-cyclical, you know, we need to inject uh, demand into the economy terms, what the person is being paid for. One current day Keynesian economist, one of the major universities, I'll leave his name out just so we won't confuse this any more than we already are, he, he actually, some time ago in a book, said, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, you could put like $100 bills in like little tubes and go bury them all around the country and then have people go dig them out and find them. Uh, and it would still inject money into the economy. It doesn't matter how you put money in the people's pockets. The point is, once they have it, they can spend, they will spend it on goods. And that's what then will get the economy moving because those goods uh, will then jolt uh, uh, manufacturers into producing more and then hiring more people and you get this sort of you know upward virtuous uh, cycle instead of the downward deflationary spiral uh, so this is the uh, this is the way uh, that this uh, might have made sense uh, when uh, many critics uh, thought this is crazy you're paying artists uh, uh, now uh, uh, right uh, on the taxpayer dime also the 
the federal uh, art project and, and the, the federal one uh, as a whole, uh, uh, in a sense, sort of took away uh, attention from some of the other things as well. So, uh, once again, there's a, uh, a method to the Roosevelt administration's madness. Another uh, key element and a great example of the more radical nature of the Second New Deal is the Social Security Act of 1935. Uh, which was a uh, push uh, uh, and much of the uh, groundwork uh, and uh, ideas behind it came from Roosevelt's Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins, you see there, her dates of birth and death somehow got uh, off the screen. Let's go back and fix that. My apologies. Uh, and on the left, you see uh, a number of years later uh, when the first checks were mailed out, it took some time between the act being passed uh, and the program being put uh, into play, but an early recipient of a Social Security check. Uh, so uh, this uh, was a, an extremely ambitious program, and it's another example of a reform, uh, and we know that partly because it's still around today, uh, and it was in part designed to uh, uh, think about uh, you know what we might do, what might be put in place already there uh, if another or other economic downturns happen. So Social Security... Uh, right, uh, designed as a partial income, it was never designed to be a full income, for senior citizens, uh, was put in place uh, not just to take care of senior citizens, but particularly in a time of economic crisis, okay, seniors will be at least partially taken care of because we'll have a fund that's coming in, you know, already full-time, uh, even when uh, times are good. Anyway, for uh, from the perspective of one of our historians uh, uh, that we've been quoting from extensively, Social Security seemed a gift on a scale most Americans would have never expected a president to able to offer. At a time of still so much need, the idea of help seemed in itself a blessing. To many of the progressives, the news that their ideas were finally becoming law was intensely gratifying. Roosevelt hoped the program would make older workers uh, comfortable with the idea of retiring earlier, leaving more work for young people. So, the progressives means sort of the more left-leaning uh, uh, members of his New Deal team. They were ecstatic because this is right up their alley. This is a more radical uh, program, also accused by uh, conservatives, Republicans, of being uh, an example of Roosevelt's and his administration's, uh, the New Dealer's penchant for socialism in their minds. And again, one can argue that. Uh, uh, and uh, so, but, but they're ecstatic. The first New Deal wasn't radical enough for some, like uh, uh, Rexford, Tugwell, uh, uh, Harry Hopkins, uh, you know, uh, etc. Remember, th there are some guys that are much more moderate. Uh, Roosevelt had a diverse group of people working for him. Roosevelt, in typical pragmatic fashion, uh, is thinking, well, not just of the old people, but this uh, might make them more comfortable uh, retiring so we can get uh, those jobs to young people uh, and help clear up the crisis in that way as well. A third uh, example of the more uh, uh, far-reaching nature of the Second New Deal uh, is the passage of the Wagner Act uh, or the, and, and the National Labor Relations Act, uh, means the same thing, uh, and the creation of the National Labor Relations Board in 1935. Uh, this uh, forbid uh, unfair labor practices, like attempting to stop workers from organizing unions, uh, trying to stop them from uh, doing collective bargaining, uh, intimidating workers, uh, firing union members, firing whistleblowers, etc., etc. This is the first time in American history that major labor uh, labor legislation uh, and a major uh, la labor agency was sort of put uh, into place at the national level. I mean, other than the Labor Department, which was there, uh, but sort of a, uh, a, a, a specific uh, uh, department that's just there, there to deal with uh, sort of watching over workers' rights uh, and watching what corporations sort of do. Curiously, uh, in 1937, uh, just when some of the economic indicators seem to be showing uh, signs uh, of recovery, not full recovery, but green shoots, as they were called in our last recession uh, uh, 10 or, or more years ago, so uh, signs that you know, the, the plant isn't fully in bloom yet, uh, isn't fully grown, but there are green shoots coming out of the ground. Just when it appeared that that's the case, uh, uh, things were jeopardized by this decision made at the very top. 
uh, Leuchtenberg telling us the prosperity of early 1937, which rested on an insecure base of mass unemployment and a sluggish construction industry, uh, had been achieved largely by the government's deficit spending. Uh, in 1937, Roosevelt worried about the danger of inflation uh, and so sh slashed spending sharply. The recession uh, that came, came about touched off a hot debate within the administration. Uh, Treasury Secretary Morgenthau, that's Henry Morgenthau, uh, believed that the failure to achieve recovery was caused by the reluctance of business to invest because if federal spending uh, would lead to inflation and heavy taxation. Uh, since the New Deal had failed to bring the country out of the Depression, according to Morgenthau, uh, the administration, he argued, should balance the budget and give business a chance to see what it could do. Uh, and he met with strong opposition uh, uh, from uh, many of the other New Dealers, uh, Harry Hopkins, Harold Ickes, uh, and, and others. So Morgenthau is actually, uh, he counsels uh, FDR to slash spending, which for sure meant cutting back uh, the budgets uh, for some of the New Deal programs, maybe even canceling some of them, uh, uh, which they actually did. Uh, and the, the economy, whether because of that or by coincidence, uh, though it would be an odd coincidence, Though coincidences happen, uh, the economy went kind of in a tailspin again. And so this has sometimes been referred to, as you see, as the Roosevelt Recession of 1937 and 1938. Uh, that, uh, that it's Roosevelt himself, and you know, at, with the, at the advice of Morgenthau, his Treasury Secretary, uh, that they, they pulled the plug on certain things, cut spending, balanced the budget, uh, less New Deal programs, uh, the funded uh, efficiently or effectively, and the economy, uh, its numbers, uh, uh, you know, move down. Uh, in, uh, employment numbers, you can kind of see there. Uh, and the unemployment rate as a whole, uh, at various uh, markers uh, during the Depression, on the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, uh, as well, you can kind of see. So uh, the numbers for unemployment uh, extremely high in 1933, 1934, uh, 1935, 1936. Uh, and they go down in 30, uh, around the same in 37, uh, go down in the end of 37, and then they're back up uh, uh, to somewhat alarming rates uh, in 38 by 17.4. So it does appear, uh, right, to so the, uh, the highest unemployment we saw is November 34, we see 23.2%. Uh, uh, it went down uh, at least somewhat every year, or every marker, 21, 15.3, 15, 13.5, until uh, Roosevelt makes this uh, uh, sort of U-turn. Uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average shows us something similar here as well, uh, right? Uh, 37, uh, it's at uh, uh, 187, um, and by the next uh, January, it's at 121. That's a rather significant issue, though it goes back up again uh, by within a couple in a couple of years. But by that time, 1940 is World War II, so uh, that changes uh, uh, the explanation uh, to some degree. So it, you can't make a case then that not only did Roosevelt's uh, actions uh, cause the economy to kind of fall, uh, you know, go backwards again, but there have been some scholars that have argued that this is this is kind of like an experiment. It wasn't an actual experiment. It wasn't done for this reason, but it's kind of like history did an experiment for us, at least such historians argue. And sometimes history does kind of do experiments for us. What do I mean? Well, it's as if, and remember, I'm saying as if. No one was actually thinking this, but it came out to be the same thing if this interpretation is correct. You could say, okay, well, the economy uh, does seem show some signs of improvement, uh, but how do we know it's because of the New Deal? Uh, how do we know uh, it's you know, unemployment's gone down, uh, right? Uh, uh, so, but how do we know that's because of the New Deal? Uh, well, I know. Uh, let's test it. Let's pull the plug on some of the New Deal and see what happens. Uh, and if if the New Deal programs being funded by the government uh, are the reason or one of the reasons why unemployment is down and other economic indicators show signs of improvement, uh, then that should change back in the opposite direction again. Now let's try it. Uh, and so they tried it, and guess what? The economy started to tank again. Uh, and so uh, Roosevelt uh, and his administration went back to Congress again, and they did, uh, and say, hey, we need to reinstate some of this. We need greater spending. We need to go back to, you know, the deficit spending that we were doing before. Uh, and 
the Congress agrees, uh, and so the New Deal is basically reinstated after a hiatus of a number of months. It wasn't totally gone, of course, in that interim. Uh, and sure enough, the economy shows signs of improvement again. So it's as if the government did an experiment. Okay, uh, the economy is improving. We, we're not sure it's because of the New Deal programs. How can we test it? We can test it by taking away temporarily the New Deal programs and seeing what happens. And guess what? The economy uh, uh, you know, declined again, went into decline, uh, and then put them back in place again uh, and see what happens then. And we sure enough put them back in place and the economy improved again. So it doesn't, of course, offer uh, conclusive proof. Uh, but it would be quite a coincidence uh, if the economy just happened to improve, decline, improve at the same time that the New Deal programs were fully in place, uh, decreased, and, and, and you know, put back in place again. Uh, so this is a, 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 a piece of evidence of the Roosevelt recession, actually, uh, that has been argued uh, by those who see the New Deal as a success story, largely, uh, you know, as a piece of evidence, uh, uh, you know, that indicating just that's that, or, you know, uh, demonstrating just that. But we saw, uh, we've seen, there are lots of possible interpretations for all this. We now get to alternatives uh, uh, to the New Deal and opposition to it. Uh, and we're certainly not going to uh, run the gamut of, of all the uh, ways that it was opposed. Uh, certainly business, uh, big business came out uh, against the New Deal as a whole. Not all businesses, not all businessmen. And very early on, in the depression, just after the stock market crash, business tended to support the New Deal for a while. But it didn't take very long uh, for one after the other, uh, another corporation to jump off uh, the bandwagon and come out in opposition. Uh, former Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon uh, made a famous comment uh, about, uh, he supposedly made that comment, according to President Hoover, early in the depression, about liquidating labor, uh, farmers, not killing them, but basically saying, let them. Let them fend for themselves, uh, and if the businesses crash, those are jobs, we'll get sort of a better, uh, more pure system on the other end, which means he's willing to let the, the people and the economy suffer uh, and, and work itself out. And he was a typical kind of old-fashioned uh, economic thinker in, in that sense. Um, and the other quotes that you can kind of uh, look at for yourself uh Liberty League uh, was a, 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 a organization of, of big businesses and businessmen that eventually came out, uh, did a lot of propaganda uh, and uh, uh, lobbying against New Deal programs. I will read the last one because it's from uh, Henry Morgenthau himself, the Treasury Secretary. Uh, he said uh, to uh, a number of uh, influential uh, figures, uh, political leaders, secretly, uh, uh, We've tried spending money. We're spending more than we have ever spent before. And it, I, when I say secretly, it means Roosevelt didn't know about it at the time. We're spending more than we have ever spent before, and it does not work. And I have just one interest. And if I am wrong, somebody else can have my job. I want to see this country prosperous. I want to see people get a job. I want to see people get enough to eat. We have never made good on our promises. I say after eight years of this administration, we have just as many unemployment uh, just as many unemployed uh, as when we started, and an enormous debt to boot. Not exactly a uh, ringing endorsement of confidence uh, from uh, you know his own Treasury Secretary there. One might might say disloyal, but Morgenthau and Roosevelt were extremely close. Uh, so th this surely did get back to Roosevelt, uh, and it didn't call a cause a permanent falling out. Morgenthau's wife said at one point. Uh, I don't know who the other person she was uh, indicating uh, was, but she said at one point, uh, my husband is only one of two people uh, that can say anything uh, uh, to FDR uh, and get away with it. Uh, I don't know who the, the second person was, but according to her, only her husband and one other person could really tell uh, Roosevelt whatever they wanted to, right to his face, and he wouldn't uh, uh, he wouldn't, you know, come back at them or fire them or, or whatever. Another uh, thorn in the side uh, of certainly Roosevelt and the administration as a whole, the New Deal, uh, was the radio priest, Tr Father Charles Coughlin. He really was a Catholic priest uh, from Detroit, uh, and uh, he uh, got a radio show uh, uh, which had a nationwide audience and eventually reached uh, about 40 million people. Uh, and uh, he sort of 
at a time when people are at their wits end trying to explain uh, you know what's happened to them and their society and their family and their jobs uh, uh, these are the kind of uh, periods uh, when this kind of st uh, economic struggle is taking place uh, and you know social uh, cultural confusion uh, where weird ideas uh, start to get a following uh, when people are confused uh, um, you know can't explain uh, uh, what's going on around them they're frightened uh, they tend to kind of grasp onto grasp at straws uh, and grab onto uh, you know uh, again ideas outside or usually outside the mainstream and that they wouldn't uh, have even considered embracing uh, you know if times were normal uh, so Coughlin's success and fame uh, is uh, I think an expression uh, of the, the, these kind of crazy times he uh, was outraged uh, in, in, in in his radio show and speeches he made again and again and again uh, at the suffering uh, inequities that he blamed on the communists, bankers, and predatory capitalists, as he called them, who he also claimed, uh, appealing to widespread anti-Semitic sentiments, were mostly Jews. Uh, so he was a, uh, a, 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 a strong anti-Semite. Uh, Coughlin became frustrated by Roosevelt's refusal to grant him influence uh, and turned against the New Deal, and in 1935 founded the excuse me, National Union for Social Justice or Union Party to challenge Roosevelt in the 1936 presidential election, uh, which uh, he didn't, uh, it didn't uh, go anywhere, uh, fortunately for Roosevelt. But, of course, FDR didn't know that at the time, and this guy was one of many uh, opponents uh, who had enough of a following and uh, you know, na a, a name recognition, 40 million people listening to your show regularly uh, is quite a following especially when the population was much smaller than it is today uh, you know, for the country as a whole. So uh, he was a serious uh, threat uh, at, at the time. Roosevelt, by the way, stood for re-election uh, in 1936 uh, to, uh, you know, for a second term, and he won by an overwhelming landslide, one of the greatest in, in American political history. I don't think it is the greatest, but it's, it's near the top, top three maybe. Uh, so, uh, and uh, this... I think, uh, told FDR and his New Deal uh, ad advisors, the Brain Trust and other leaders, Hopkins, uh, Ickes, you know, Morgan, Morgenthau, others, that the public was on their side, that they had a mandate from the people, as uh, they now say in politics today. Uh, and it may be true. Uh, so, uh, and he was extremely confident, I believe, that he did have the public behind him since he'd already pushed through the first and second New Deal by the time the election came in 1936. And when he ran, uh, doing, a, you know, a, the campaign, uh, in, uh, speeches, uh, he, he got more aggressive and, and more radical in his rhetoric, uh, in his, uh, public appearances than he had been, uh, earlier in his presidency. So, famously... In a speech he made at Madison Square Garden in New York City uh, during the election campaign of 1936, uh, he spoke uh, to the crowd, and surely he knew there were bankers and corporate leaders uh, in the audience or that they would read the paper and you know, hear about it the next day. Uh, but he said uh, that about his programs, about the New Deal, uh, that uh, I'm going to uh, engender their hatred, uh, and, I, uh, I, I, and I, wel I welcome it. Uh, basically, I will bring, like bring it on. Uh, they're going to hate me for this, and I I welcome I welcome their hatred. So uh, it's the kind of thing that Roosevelt would not say uh, if he if he didn't already know the public was going to support him behind this. Uh, again, a careful, crafty, somewhat manipulative politician uh, in Roosevelt uh, doesn't make those kind of statements unless he already knows that it's going to go over well, uh, at least uh, uh, with the public. And remember also that he's the kind of president, like Woodrow Wilson before him, uh, that likes to go straight to the public uh, and get massive support from the, the public uh, and use that to try to uh, intimidate uh, uh, the other branches, other uh, elements of government and go around them or, or sort of right over the top of them. So uh, he's able to do that more effectively now after a landslide victory in 1936. But uh, there were other opponents uh, who were serious and looked uh, menacing as well. Maybe none more so than the kingfish, Huey P. Long uh, of Louisiana, uh, uh, and the demagogic appeal. Uh, he wasn't the only demagogue of the period, but he certainly, I think, was the most successful uh, and in some ways the most scary. Uh, 
Uh, this guy had a kind of a, he was the governor of Louisiana, then got elected senator, uh, just uh, uh, as President Roosevelt was being elected uh, president. But uh, he ran Louisiana uh, like it was a uh, like he was a dictator, like a dictatorship. Uh, he was an authoritarian, uh, and in many ways, kind of a scary guy. And he was putting up opposition uh, to Roosevelt, and had a following, not just uh, at you know in Louisiana, uh, certainly beyond that. So uh, Wilford McClay uh, says perhaps the greatest threat to Roosevelt from the left, anyway, came from Huey P. Long of Louisiana, a governor and a senator from that state whose combination of generous populist policies, meaning uh, po uh, policies going directly, uh, uh, you know, to the, the uh, benefiting the public, he also was trying to go around uh, other uh, wings and branches of uh, you know, government at the state and national level uh, and go straight to the people. So. You could say that Roosevelt was uh, demagogic in his appeal somewhat too, just not with one of the severe authoritarian uh, uh, you know, streak that Long had in him. Uh, demagogic rhetoric, uh, uh, for sure, uh, and an unscrupulous control of the levers of power uh, that won him a huge following, and the enduring enmity of governing elites, including Roosevelt. Roosevelt thought he was one of the most dangerous people in America and kept his eye on him extremely uh, carefully. Uh, a fellow Democrat of Long's in his home state of Louisiana said, frankly, we're afraid of him. He's unscrupulous beyond belief. He might say anything about me, something entirely untrue, but it would ruin me in my state. It's like challenging a buzzsaw. He will go to the limit. It's safer for me and the rest of us to just leave him alone. Uh, so uh, even his own colleagues in his own party uh, were afraid of this guy. Uh, so Long had a, a, a real... Uh, scary energy about him. Uh, after election to the Senate in 1932, Sammy Roosevelt was elected the first time. Uh, he introduced his "Soak the Rich" tax bill. Uh, and it didn't. It didn't go through, uh, but it sent shockwaves of fear, uh, certainly through the Republican uh, establishment uh, and corporate America, and even in the Roosevelt administration, uh, since uh, his movement, his following uh, was even to the left of the political spectrum of the New Deal. Another uh, challenger, uh, a more benign one to be sure, uh, was good old Upton Sinclair, the novelist, uh, muckraker, who wrote the novel The Jungle, already talked about in an earlier unit. Uh, he ran for governor of California in the middle of the Depression in 1934. Uh, and uh, his End Poverty in California program, or EPIC, uh, right, uh, was a, a plan to basically uh, gradually introduce a socialist economy. Uh, our uh, lovable professor Rourke says, socialists and communists accuse the New Deal of being the handmaiden of business elites and of rescuing capitalism from its self-inflicted crisis. Socialist Upton Sinclair ran for governor of California in 1934 on a plan that the state, uh, the state take ownership of idle factories and unused land and then give them to cooperatives of working people, a first step toward putting the needs of people above profits. Sinclair lost the election, though he won the Democratic nomination, ending the most serious socialist electoral challenge to the New Deal. So another challenge from the left, not as scary. Uh, Upton Sinclair, I think, was a good guy, uh, more like a kind of a Bernie Sanders-type socialist. That's not something you could say about uh, Huey P. Long, who we just uh, covered. But both of them were politicians with a large following. This guy in the biggest state, uh, uh, right, California, our state, a large following that uh, threatened to outflank Roosevelt from the left. The businessmen we already talked about that came out against him uh, were uh, usually supporters of right-wing or Republican politicians that were uh, threatening uh, as well. Of all of the obstacles uh, and opposition that Roosevelt had to face, I think the most taxing for him, uh, partly for obvious reasons, was the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, which had a, a tumultuous relationship with the New Deal, to put it mildly. Uh, not surprising, because the Supreme Court uh, is a powerful element of the federal government. Uh, it's the head, of course, of the judicial branch, one of the three branches of government. So uh, the Supreme Court has a lot of power. But uh, I'm refreshing your memory, but uh, uh, hopefully you'll pick up on this quickly, because we've already covered it actually a couple of times in this unit and before. And I've said it a couple times already, it's so my third time th in this unit, Roosevelt, following Woodrow Wilson, uh, went straight to the public uh, and particularly uh, was uh, um, 
both of them were particularly unhappy uh, uh, with the Supreme Court's power. They thought of the Supreme Court as largely undemocratic because they weren't elected. Uh, justices, uh, right, nine of them appointed for life by the president, uh, and uh, and they th th it enraged them even at the possibility, but certainly the reality, uh, if the Supreme Court opposed a president who was pushing a policy through, uh, a, a law through by popular acclaim because the public you know overwhelmingly supported, uh, and the Supreme Court blocked it, and that's what the Supreme Court started to do uh, to New Deal legislation led by uh, its Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes. You see in the bottom center there, a brilliant uh, man, if there ever was one, a former politician, governor of, I think, New York, uh, and uh, uh, Chief Justice at two separate, uh, in two separate stints in, in his career. Uh, but the Supreme Court, the way it was structured in terms of liberals and conservatives, was to the disadvantage of Roosevelt and his New Deal, uh, during this period with these guys right here, because four of them uh, were conservative justices, and three of them uh, were liberal justices, and the other two were in the middle. Uh, and uh, the, the guys that are in the middle are always called swing justices, which means that they sometimes vote one way, sometimes vote the other side, but they're usually considered to be the crucial ones because it's their votes that aren't always clear. The four conservatives here, the vote was almost always on the same side of each other. Yeah, the, the three liberals uh, almost always on the other side uh, and you know, allied with each other. Uh, but the two swing votes were the ones that were always in play, or at least they, you know, they were potentially in play. And one of the swing justices was the Chief Justice Hughes, the other one a guy named Owen Roberts, uh, who I think is the guy sitting to Hughes's left, uh, though it could, be the, it could be the next guy over from there too, I forget. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, we already talked about the National Recovery Administration and the Agricultural uh, Agricultural Adjustment Act, which I said were kind of the centerpieces for the first New Deal, uh, one to kind of uh, get the uh, manufacturing economy going again, make it recover, uh, and the other uh, to get the farm economy uh, moving so it could recover economically. Uh, and sure enough. Uh, through uh, uh, there are many court cases filed against New Deal uh, rulings and legislation, uh, and uh, and some of them got to the Supreme Court. And these two, uh, not only got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court overturned New Deal legislation. The Schechter poultry case uh, in 1935, when it was finally decided, Schechter brothers uh, ran a poultry business in New York, uh, and uh, they believed uh, that uh, this uh, violated their constitutional rights. Uh, the uh, NRA uh, got in their way. We're not going to get into the details. Uh, and sure enough, the Supreme Court upheld their side of the case, which by all intents and purposes made the National Recovery Act unconstitutional. And it was done. Uh, and the same thing happened the next year uh, when uh, the United States v. Butler case was decided, uh, basically with the same uh, numbers. Uh, the swing justices uh, right, following into line in these cases uh, behind the uh, four other conservative justices. I, I forget if it was both of them. Keep in mind, with this dynamic, it gives the conservatives an advantage uh, all the time because since there's there's nine people in the Supreme Court, uh, right, so uh, to get a majority, you only need five, so there's already four conservatives. So f in any case the conservative side only needs to get one of the two swing justices to vote with them, and they win. Uh, but the liberals, uh, who only have three uh, consistent liberal justices, if they want to win, they have to get both uh, of the swing justices on every case uh, on their side, or they don't win. So, uh, you know, it sounds like a small numerical difference, but it's actually a rather large advantage for the conservatives, disadvantage for the liberals, and a huge uh, series of losses for President Roosevelt, who was not happy about it to put it mildly. And what he did next, I think, shows it in spades. The court packing scheme uh, and what it tells us. Uh, so, FDR, uh, <laughs> after uh, his legislation got overturned, uh, not once but twice, there were some other cases too, smaller, uh, but uh, he was infuriated and he started to lash out at the Supreme Court. His most famous uh, public declaration, uh, at least part of it, was he called uh, 
the way the court was interpreting his New Deal programs and legislation, the horse and buggy definition of interstate commerce. Uh, horse and buggy, right, means like a carriage, horse drawn. It's like saying, this is like the old days. These guys are like living in the 19th century. Uh, they're doing this sort of like dinosaurs. Uh, why don't they get in the modern world and understand that what I'm doing here uh, is, uh, you know, for the, the best of the whole country. Uh, but to show uh, how enraged Roosevelt was at the Supreme Court's audacity and also uh, how uh, full of himself he was as president, or at least as full of uh, how much he thought uh, the uh, how much authority he thought the president had, he unleashed or unveiled, uh, I should say, his court packing scheme uh, in 1937. Uh, he proposed this was a jaw dropping. He actually announced this in a public uh, event uh, when the country had heard nothing of it. Some of his uh, you know assistants. Uh, advisors knew about it, uh, but he insisted on doing this cult, kind of cold. Some of them advised, no, why don't you just sort of roll this out kind of gradually and uh, hint at it. Uh, and, nope, uh, I'm going to go. Roosevelt liked to shock people. Uh, he had a real penchant for it. So he, he, this was just jaw-dropping to everyone in the room and everyone who heard about it and read about it in the paper the next day. He proposed an additional six new justices be created, appointed the Supreme Court for life, for every justice uh, on the court that was over 70. Uh, and I forget how many it was, but it was a number of them that were over 70. And he claimed uh, everybody knew it was a lie. Everybody, the second it came out of his mouth, the second they read it in the newspaper. He claimed, I'm, I'm just doing this because these poor justices are, you know, they're older guys, uh, they're brilliant guys, uh, and they already have a huge amount of work on their, you know, uh, and they just get sort of buried with all these uh, cases. So if we add new justices, it'll spread out the workload, and they can uh, and sort of do a bit less work, uh, you know, in their uh, you know later years on the Supreme Court. Uh, of course, everybody knew what he was doing was threatening them uh, and saying, if you don't start, if you don't start deciding cases, defending uh, and upholding New Deal legislation like the NRA, uh, that I'm going to put new justices on there who will be all liberals. Uh, and they'll outvote you because the conservatives will definitely be in a minority uh, sort of when, when I do this. Uh, so uh, as Stephen Knott says uh, in a, I think in this case, a very deservedly critical vein, uh, uh, extremely critical of the FDR, uh, rightly so, FDR's effort, quote, to bring the Supreme Court in line with the New Deal policies that was the most damaging and irresponsible event of his presidency. Yet it was utterly predictable in that FDR saw himself as the heir to Jefferson and Jackson, and in no arena was this comparison more relevant than in his war against the judiciary. Roosevelt was the only president to publicly attack the Supreme Court and did so on multiple occasions. He sought to fulfill the wishes of the progressive, uh, of the progressives to convert the Constitution into, quote, a living document that kept abreast with the times. He believed that the failure of the court to uphold his New Deal agenda represented a failure of democracy. The wishes of the majority of the public should guide the decisions of the Supreme Court, not the Constitution. He crossed a line that no president should ever cross. His demagogic attacks on the independence of the judiciary are contrary to the essence of a constitutional republic. The American system was never intended to be speedy, which is why the founders created a republic, not a democracy. Once again, now this is arguable, of course, uh, and it's tempting when you read this uh, initially, and maybe even uh, on upon a second and third reading, to agree with Roosevelt's sentiments. Uh, but I would ask you uh, to at least consider the other side of this, to consider uh, what uh, Professor Knott is saying here, because I think it gets to the essence of some of our uh, issues uh, uh, about the Constitution uh, today. Uh, so uh, I actually, as I said, do agree with him here on this uh, one, though I could be wrong, of course, too, uh, that uh, Roosevelt uh, was going too far here. Uh, our uh, constitutional system uh, has served us well for 230 years. Not that it, you know, is a holy uh, document, not that it never needs to be uh, rethought uh, and amended here and there, but uh, I, I think paying pl a president playing fast and loose with the Constitution uh and we've seen it in more recent times as well, uh, is a potentially dangerous thing. We get to the last uh, segment uh, of our unit here, uh, and you're almost uh, finished with unarguably my hardest and most difficult unit to get through, so congratulations, or, or almost congratulations. 
the bottom-up perspective, the hardships of average Americans during the Depression. Uh, and remember, uh, most of what we've talked about, uh, or most of uh, our perspective so far, has been the top-down one. So, uh, you know, Roosevelt, uh, the New Deal, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, you know, the, the leading uh, political figures of the day. But I think it's important to get a real sense of what life was like in the Depression to look at it from the bottom up, uh, to uh, look at it from the social historian's perspective uh, and sort of see them, what was, uh, ask the question, what was life like for average people uh, in the Depression? And uh, there are some uh, uh, writings, uh, some uh, things that I recommend, and you see them right here on the screen. Uh, Steinbeck's, John Steinbeck, the great American novelist, his uh, fantastic uh, book, uh, The Grapes of Wrath, is a fictional book, but it's about the Great Depression. And he lived through it. Uh, he, you know, did some, uh, I don't know if you call it research, but he sort of, you know, ma made sure that it was at least fairly accurate. And if you want to try to understand what it was like, and remember, remember, I told you at the outset, it's hard. It's hard for me as a teacher to get students to really kind of feel what the depression must have been like. The numbers don't really, you know, the, the unemployment numbers don't, you know, they don't really sort of hit you uh, in the gut. They don't really give you a feel for how difficult this must have been uh, for America as a whole uh, and for individuals. But a, a piece of uh, fiction, uh, at least a, a you know, literary piece of fiction like this, uh, can, in this case, certainly does deliver those goods. So Steinbeck uh, writes a fictional story about a, a Dust Bowl family. Uh, the Dust Bowl migrations from Oklahoma uh, territory, uh, partially a product of terrible weather conditions, drought uh, conditions during the Depression. So, uh, you know, sort of one problem compounding another. And a lot of families lost their homes, their farms, and uh, moved, oddly enough, many of them to California. And so this family is one of them. And they hear that things are better in California. And so they pack up all their belongings and you know, they, bought, they got their farm uh, foreclosed. Take the whole family, including grandpa or grandma, I forget, as long as they read it, uh, all their belongings in the big truck uh, and get to California and only to find that things are just as bad, if not worse, there. Uh, and there's no real happy ending to the story. The family just sort of continues to spin its wheels and can't find a way out. One of the sons... Uh, turns to socialism, etc., uh, etc. Et it's depressing, uh, but it does give you a real feel for what uh, uh, the uh, you know uh, work a day American uh, went through in the Depression. Another book that I think achieves something uh, along those lines uh, in a different genre is uh, Hard Times on the right hand of the screen by a guy with a, a great name, Studs Terkel. Uh, he just died a, a number of years ago. He was like 101 years old. Uh, but he only looked like he was about a hundred. <laughs> uh, he really looked ancient, but he was—he uh, had his uh, mind in complete, uh, complete control of his mind. Uh, all of his faculties were there right up until the end. An amazing individual. Uh, but he wrote *Hard Times*, an oral history, an oral history of the Great Depression. And after this, he wrote a number of other oral histories about different uh, eras in American history. But this was his most famous uh, book by far. An oral history means that you go around interviewing people that live through a certain time uh, or a series of events in history uh, and sort of write down or record what they say and then uh, publish it or publish pieces of it. Uh, and that's what Turkle did. Went all across the country uh, interviewing people from all walks of life, uh, poor, middle class, even some rich people from different professions, coal miners, farmers, uh, steel workers, uh, etc., etc., and then edited it because he had it's in one volume, uh, and uh, you get little bits and pieces uh, of stories from people. Now, oral histories, of course, have their drawbacks. You can never know for sure if the person is lying or uh, you know their memory is faulty or, or you know it's in, they embellish something. Uh, nonetheless, with those caveats, I think you read this, and I did it again years ago. Uh, and there are still things that stick with me, even though I, don't think ever, I have it on my shelf. I don't think I've picked it up in years. Uh, but uh, it does give you a, a sense. These are true stories, if people were telling the truth. Uh, and uh, it's just shocking uh, what, what you what you learn. I remember one story, uh, just to give you one. I, I could probably rattle off at least, I don't know, eight or nine. Uh, but um, not no more than that. It's been a while. One... Uh, Two, uh, two sisters uh, were at school, elementary school, and 
a teacher came up to uh, uh, one of them, uh, or the d girl was just in the class, and, um, and the teacher came up and said, "You you should go home and eat." You, you know, she was like the the girl was like emaciated looking. Uh, you haven't looked. Like you haven't eaten in days. You need to go home and, uh, and get something to eat. And she said, "I can't. It's my sister's turn to eat today," uh, which meant that the family strategy uh, for you know survival because they didn't have enough food to go around was to have uh, one kid eat one day uh, and their second child, I guess they only had two kids, eat the next day. Uh, thank God they had uh, no more than two. Uh, but uh, they, they alternated days in eating uh, uh, it all. Uh, so uh, that's only one of many, many examples like this uh, from this sort of great work. So uh, I would recommend these two books highly. Uh, if you're interested in the Depression, as depressing, uh, pardon the pun, as it, as it may be, uh, it is an interesting and important subject. The series of photographs uh, by Dorothea Lange, uh, the most famous of which you see right in the middle of the screen, uh, another source you can go to. Uh, she went around the country photographing uh, people in uh, you know, despair uh, and in difficult uh, times. Uh, here you see a, a woman uh, with kids sort of draped all over her, uh, and the look on her face in an in-class uh, situation. I usually ask students, what do you think? Uh, and what does it appear she's thinking here? And of course, we don't know. I don't know. You don't know. Uh, but it, it looks like she's worried. Uh, she looks kind of thin herself, emaciated. Uh, the kids, they're not facing us, but you know we don't know. Uh, but it looks like she's sort of saying... Uh, thinking to herself, what am I going to do? How am I going to, where am I going to get a job? Where am I going to get money to feed my kids? Uh, uh, where, 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 so, uh, now, th again, it's a whole series of famous photographs. Uh, 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 this is the most famous. It is true that Dorothea Lang staged some of these photographs. Not that that's a, an actress, uh, but sometimes she said, okay, put your hand here, or you know, do this, that. Uh, at other times, she just took them, you know, sort of cold, without people necessarily knowing they were being photographed. And this one, I'm not sure. Uh, so with that, you know, um, explanation, uh, right, with that qualification, uh, uh, I, I still think you can learn a lot uh, about uh, uh, you know, the, de the depression in a way that personalizes it from uh, this set of photographs. Average Americans had to take agency uh, in the depression. Uh, agency is a word historians love to use, which basically means, right, you're an agent of your own destiny. Destiny It means you have to take matters into your own hands. Uh, so showing agency means you're not just, uh, uh, you know, you're using your free will uh, and your uh, desire and your drive uh, to make things happen for yourself in your life. And even with the New Deal in place, helping millions of people uh, in one relief program or, you know, a jobs program or another, it was still necessary for almost all Americans to uh, get up off their couch uh, and help themselves because uh, even the help from the New Deal wasn't usually enough. Uh, so uh, it, this is one of the reasons why a bottom-up look at the Depression is so valuable. If we just look at Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, it makes it appear, without saying it, that Americans without jobs were just sitting around waiting for a check to come from the government or waiting for the government to say, hey, you got this job, uh, you know, show up. Uh, but in fact, truth be told, uh, Americans had to do, go out and sort of uh, beat the pavement a great deal uh, to make ends meet themselves, uh, to look for jobs. Here we see them uh, uh, protesting and demonstrating uh, uh, in certain cases, uh, but uh, having to do all kinds of things on their own. So the traditional approach to the Depression we've really already done. Uh, top-down political history, uh, which is still valuable. I mean, you can't avoid, I think, Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Deal if you want to understand the Depression. Uh, but also, you've got to look at some bottom-up social history, uh, and one place to begin is agency. Uh, Americans sort of taking matters into their own hands, again, because they had no choice. A great example of this comes early in the Depression, still during the Hoover administration, uh, with the efforts of the Bonus Army of 1932. Uh, this is a tens of thousands, about 40,000 veterans of World War I who were owed pensions. They were called bonuses, but they were owed pensions by the U.S. government, and they were they came to Washington from all over the country. People we rode on you know, the trains, boxcars, jumped on trains, and walked uh, to get uh, to Washington, D.C., uh, and the Bonus Army, former uh, you know uh, military personnel, veterans of World War One, occupied uh, abandoned government buildings and kind of set up a uh, you know sort of a tent, uh, sort of shanty town 
temporarily uh, as they you know went to the nearby Capitol. You can see the background of the fire there uh, and protested in front of the Congress, uh, the building, uh, the Capitol uh, every day to try to pressure Congress into passing a bonus bill, basically giving them their pensions early. Uh, the House actually passed the bonus bill. Uh, and when the protesters outside heard about it, a huge roar of approval went up, uh, sheer from the crowd, only to see, I forget how long after it was, the Senate rejecting it by a wide margin. Many veterans staying on after uh, it was voted down by the Senate, which means they're not going to get what they want, uh, and they refused to leave the Capitol. It caused President Hoover to be fearful that the riots would break out, and so he ordered uh, Army General Douglas MacArthur, not famous yet, but would go on to be famous, to evict the Bowman's army from his camp. You see the young MacArthur there on the uh, lower left. And by his side, Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, his subordinate officer. Uh, but President Hoover ordered military troops into these camps, right? Some of them heroes of World War One, veterans of World War One, uh, risked their lives for the country. Uh, and the, the military had treated like them, treated like they were criminals. Uh, and uh, uh, there was some violence. They burned the Shanty Towns and uh, uh, basically intimidated them and bludgeoned them uh, out of their camps. And uh, uh, Hoover certainly didn't mean for it to go that far. Uh, Douglas MacArthur, if you don't already know anything about him, uh, history will learn more uh, in the next couple of units. Becomes a, a major national hero in World War II and beyond. Uh, but he always was somewhat of a loose cannon. Uh, and so if Hoover wanted this to be done, uh, in a more tactful, uh, 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 I wouldn't say gentle, but a more nuanced way. Uh, he sent the wrong guy, and he probably should have known that ahead of time if he didn't already. So MacArthur uh, leaned on this heavily, and there were other issues as well, but for President Hoover's purposes, probably nothing more important than how damaging this was from a public relations perspective, which I mentioned uh, earlier when we talked about a Hoover, and I say here, see earlier slide, on Hoover administration. Uh, but my main point here with this is though the Bonus Army failed, it's a great example of average Americans banding together uh, and doing things on their own outside of government, in this case pressuring government from outside, uh, but not sitting around uh, on their keisters just waiting for the government to sort of uh, you know, hand things out to them. Another good example of agency on the part of Americans are the unemployed councils. Uh, these were, uh, early on at least, organized by uh, the Commun American Communist Party, or part of it, uh, which has always caused them to be seen in suspicion, uh, not incorrectly. Uh, but they may have done some good still. Uh, in the end, uh, they did some marches and demonstrations and, and things like this, but they started to form local organizations, cities and towns, uh, where... Uh, th hundreds or thousands or neighborhoods of Americans band together and agreed to kind of cooperate with each other and help each other out through the Depression, kind of in an informal way. So an unemployed council would sort of uh, have uh, leaders who would get together and try to help find jobs. People, if someone got evicted from their home for couldn't pay rent, they trying to find trying to find new new housing for them. They often had connections with, uh, you know, gov local government officials, etc. So it was mainly at kind of the local level. The unemployed councils may have had their biggest impact, but the things that happened at the national level, uh, you know, of course, made uh, more uh, news. You can see the stuff that happened in Pittsburgh uh, on the left there. Another great example of agency, maybe the the most wide ranging of all, uh, was uh, the wave of strikes that took place uh, throughout the decade of the 30s during the Depression. Not surprisingly, since it's a gigantic downturn, people are losing jobs, getting laid off, getting their wages cut, their hours cut. Uh, the sit-down strike, uh, a more specific type of strike, uh, had its heyday here. I don't know if it was invented uh, in the Great Depression. Uh, it probably wasn't, uh, but it could have uh, uh, caught fire uh, and swept the country. Uh, unlike uh, a normal strike, uh, the same type we've talked about earlier in the class, where Strikers right, went out on strike and formed a picket line outside the factory. Uh, the sit-down strikes uh, uh, were exactly what they say. And you can see it in the pictures here. The guys just sat down inside the factory and refused to leave. Uh, and it posed the management and ownership with lots of problems uh, they didn't have uh, in the more traditional type of striking. One of which is that they're much more reluctant to break into the factory and take the guys out by force 
not because they don't want to hurt the, uh, their workers, because they don't want to hurt their machinery, uh, which is very expensive. Uh, so, which I'm not saying it never happened, but they were reluctant uh, because uh, uh, you know they knew things would get smashed up if they tried to go in by by force. So, sit down strikes. Uh, the big ones uh, in the country started at Akron, Ohio, in the uh, rubber and tire uh, factories. There, that was the uh, heart of the rubber industry. And then the biggest one, single sit down strike, uh, happened at the General Motors plant in Flint, Michigan, in 1937. Now, what you see pictured here. Uh, so the sit-down was uh, uh, kind of, an, in a sense, a new method of striking. There were also general strikes in the 1930s. A general strike means when the whole city goes out on strike. Workers in every, not every, I mean, that's the ideal. Uh, but uh, the ideal, the, the goal is to get all workers, whatever their job, whether they're a baker, a factory worker, a longshoreman, whatever, to all go out on strike in sympathy with each other. It's usually one group of workers uh, in San Francisco, where the quote comes from here in the middle, uh, it was dock workers or longshoremen that went on strike, and then the other bakers and other uh, workers in the community heard about it uh, and went on like a sympathy strike. Uh, we're going to strike. going to strike alongside our fellow, you know, brethren, uh, uh, you know, uh, comrades in arms, fellow workers in another, uh, you know, job, because uh, uh, we're all on the same side. We're in this together. Uh, and so, uh, a general strike is when not all, again, all is the goal, but a lot of different uh, workers in different industries in the same city uh, go out on strike at the same time. They're basically going to shut down the economics, uh, the business activity of a city. And the San Francisco general strike, which not much is known about uh, uh, here, even though we're uh, not too far from there, uh, but uh, reading uh, from uh, McIlvain's book, the strike was remarkably effective. A journalist uh, described the city on the first morning of the shutdown. No streetcars were operating. No buses. No taxis. No delivering wagons except milk. Delivering wagons except milk and bread trucks, which were operated with the permission of the general strike committee. No filling uh, stations were open. Means gas stations. No theaters. No shops. Many small storekeepers showed that elements of the middle class identified with the workers' goals. Signs appeared in the windows reading "Close till the boys win." Uh, San Francisco was paralyzed. Uh, later in the strike, there was actually a running battle, at least on one day, between the police and strikers on the Embarcadero. Uh, I don't know if anyone was killed. There might have been a couple of fatalities. There were certainly a lot of people wounded and injured, a lot of cars burned and tipped over. So this was a big-time strike, uh, a, a general strike. And there were a number of these across the, the country in the 1930s. But again, back to my general point here, and that is that all of these strikes, whether San Francisco, Flint, Michigan, uh, Akron, Ohio, or anywhere else, are yet again great examples of average Americans not sitting back and waiting uh, for a New Deal, uh, you know, FDR uh, uh, agency or program uh, to send them a check or give them a job. They're taking matters into their own hands because they have no choice. Another way that uh, Americans took matters into their own hands uh, was to sort of uh, try to get away from it all uh, for a time. Uh, the silver screen, uh, right? The movies took off uh, during the Depression. Movies were actually really cheap. Uh, so uh, even if you didn't have a job or you know didn't have a, a high-paying job, uh, you could literally afford uh, the movies. And in those days, you could, I don't know, for a nickel, a dime, I forget what the price, I don't wasn't alive then, uh, but uh, you could... And like pay you know, a, a pittance, uh, and not only see one movie, you usually get to see two, uh, a double feature with a, a newsreel in the middle. In the 30s, there was no TV uh, in homes yet, uh, so uh, oftentimes if you if you weren't reading the newspaper, you could get the news by going to a movie theater, uh, and in between movies, uh, they'd run a newsreel to tell you what's happening in the country and in the world, uh, etc. So you could waste a good part of a day there uh, and get away from your problems and forget about them by watching uh, movies. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, among others, Joseph P. Kennedy uh, uh, cashed in on this, and he went out to Hollywood uh, himself for a time and invested in motion pictures and made money uh, there, as well as everywhere else that he put his you know uh, uh, energies into. Uh, in the uh, first part of the Depression, the movies, through the whole Depression, the movies tended to mirror what's happening in society. That's the point here. Uh, so people are going to get away from it all, uh, but sometimes it's coming back to them, uh, and they seem to still be coming back themselves uh, uh, because it's, you know, it's telling them what they kind of need to hear. Uh, 
So, for instance, in 1933, uh, just after Roosevelt uh, uh, became president, uh, a number of movies uh, came out uh, that was tend to be kind of the, the common denominator that year. Uh, as uh, uh, one of my sources says, shows almost the magical, I think it was McElvain, shows almost the magical hopes of 1933. This sort of optimistic nonsense could not have been sold to audiences in 1932, before Roosevelt came into office. Uh, a musical called 42nd Street. And you see at the top, uh, inaugurating a new deal in entertainment. So they're even uh, using marketing techniques that capitalize on Roosevelt's popularity uh, and, the, and the deal. By 1937, uh, right now years in, and people are uh, much more uh, uh, dismayed, much more disillusioned and cynical because the, the public still tends to support uh, Roosevelt. They don't see it as his fault, even if it may have been part of it. But there's there's still like wait a minute, the New Deal's been around now for four plus years, and we're still in you know deep deep uh, uh, you know difficulties economically, uh, unemployment and you know, everything else. Uh, and uh, a movie from that year that reflects this is Dead End with Humphrey Bogart. I love the little uh, campaign or the little uh, movie poster there, uh, which uh, from McIlvain uh, again says starkly portrays the life of the urban slum dweller and the contrast between rich and poor. So uh, a lot of the movies uh, in the latter part of the Depression, when people started to get, again, cynical about the New Deal uh, and came to criticize uh, wealth and power in the country uh, and look at things from a class angle. But one way or the other, this was still also, uh, in all cases, still a, a way to kind of get away from it all uh, and uh, be a diversion. Uh, and certainly shrewd of Joseph B. Kennedy and anybody else that invested in motion pictures in the 1930s to do so. Average Americans also took the law into their own hands at times. On the left, you see a photograph of uh, bootleg coal mining, which meant that people coal mines went out of business, uh, but their coal seams uh, are still there. The coal, you know, the you know, tunnels are still there. So uh, people uh, would just sort of go in and start mining coal uh, on land they didn't own, coal that wasn't theirs to, to keep, and they take it anyway. Sometimes they get caught and get prosecuted, but uh, they would give it away, uh, take it to the, take it home, sell it on the black market for a cheaper price, uh, and uh, uh, this was uh, a way of making ends meet. Uh, black market goods, bootleg coal. People would rob stores at times. Uh, I've read a number of accounts of people kind of together going into like a, a, a country like grocery store somewhere uh, and holding the owner at gunpoint. Uh, one person holding a gun and everyone else saying, you know, we're going to, sorry, Mr. So-and-so, they probably know the guy and like him. Uh, we need to take some butter and some eggs and some flour, uh, some bacon, because my kids are starving uh, and I don't know what else to do. Uh, so, uh, sorry about this, see you later. And it's a difficult situation to evaluate, for sure, and different people would have different conclusions, because, let's say the gun was even a, uh, you know, wasn't even a real gun. The owner of the store doesn't know that. That's why it's armed robbery today, uh, even if the gun you use is fake. Uh, I, I think it's armed robbery for good reason. You're traumatizing the person that you're stealing from. They don't know that. Uh, so the poor guy here, and, and I'm just giving you kind of a hypothetical example, but there were real cases like this in the Depression. The, the guy's been traumatized, so, and you've committed a felony. Uh, and yet, as I ask at the bottom, uh, and the, you know, the question there, would you break the law, uh, right, if you, your kids were starving. And if you, let's say, let's take this further. If you thought you'd done everything possible, maybe there's something you, you you hadn't thought of, but let's say you thought, I've thought of everything and nothing. I tried to borrow money from my family. I tried to go to a bank. I've tried every day to get a job. I can't get a job. I've tried, tried you know, the neighbors to loan me money. Uh, I, I Nothing has worked. And my kids are getting thin and sick uh, and sickly looking. Uh, emaciated, pale, I'm afraid they're going to get sick and die, I'm going to have to go rob a store. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, uh, I, I'm a law-abiding citizen, I, I believe in uh, following the law, but I just throw it out there. If your kids were starving and you thought you'd done everything else in your power and you and you thought they were not probably not going to make it, even if you're wrong about that, but you were convinced, would you consider taking the law into your own hands? And I've asked this in live classes many, many times, and it's usually the overwhelming majority of class that raises their hand saying that they, that they would. Uh, 
which isn't surprising. Uh, most of us would you know, go to great lengths uh, uh, to help defend uh, and I'll keep our families healthy. Uh, so, uh, but this does show again uh, agency uh, Americans taking matters into their own hands in a different way, uh, this time acting illegally. Uh, whether right or wrong, back to my main point, it's uh, an example of agency. Americans were not, I know I've made this point several times now, but they were not just sitting around uh, waiting for Franklin D. Roosevelt to help them out. 